So my name is Mike, and I'm going to hold the talk, uh, as you can see, introduction into Rust programming on bare metal hardware. Um, I was way too ambitious for this talk, so I had to chop it down quite a bit, and that includes the introduction of myself, so if you want to know more about me, follow those uh, links. So my name is Mike, and I like uh, penguins. This I left in. So who is this uh, talk for? Well, everybody that has written Rust software and uh, have, has written something cooler than the Hello World app and used uh, the cargo built tool to do it. And of course, existing embedded programmers, be it in Rust or Ada, C++, uh, MicroPython, uh, yeah, what have you, to get a feel of what's happening. So who is an existing Rust programmer? Almost everyone I saw before even, cool. And uh, who is writing embedded code for a living? Oh, wow, okay. I hope I can teach you something new. It's an introduction, mind you. <laughs> Good, so that's uh, the content for people on YouTube. When they know that they know all of this, then they can already continue to the next video. Basically, I'll be explaining what is the bare metal hardware and what is this uh, no STD thingy. Then, of course, uh, we will run the Rust code on a microcontroller, which I have prepared. Then I will show you debugging, even though I'm not a specialist in debugging. And um, yeah, the ultimate goal of this talk is to show you how to communicate with the microcontroller over USB and um, how this can be done easily with this Arctic uh, version 2, um, which was just not released, but it's available. <laughs> So bare metal targets. Ah, I should explain first what's bare metal programming. So normally when we program, we have an operating system that helps us quite a bit, right? It gives us a file system and a networking stack and all kinds of other cool stuff. And sometimes we even actually program for a browser which runs an operating system then, you know, and then it layers get deeper when you go onto the cloud and stuff. Bare metal means we talk to the processor or the microcontroller directly. That means we have to Right, everything ourselves, right? There's no memory management, there's nobody taking, holding our hands for networking, no file system exists. And uh, that's what I'll be talking today. So embedded programming can also be on an embedded Linux machine. And uh, here are some targets that I have personally used. There are many more at the bottom. You can see the link for what is potentially possible with the Rust compiler. I do not suggest uh, anyone to use the Arduino, the first one because the LLVM actually does not have good support for those AVR-based uh, chips. So I ran into fu funny problems even with basic arithmetic. So really, <laughs> if you want to have a fun time with an 8-bit processor, go ahead, but uh, maybe not for a beginner. Then the ST microboards, the STM32 series, they are actually fairly cool to use. They, of course, use a super old USB connector, but they have compatibility often with uh, existing Arduino boards. So that would be a good starting platform. Then the Silinx uh, Sync series. This is super expensive stuff because it has an FPGA attached to the ARM um, CPU. And it is also way more um, actually a computer with an FPGA and runs Linux uh, by default. But there is a Silinx um, or actually a Sync RS crate or collection of crates um, that basically provides everything that you need to run the Ethernet with a small TCP, to run uh, the file system on the SD card, well, a eh, file system, and all the other stuff. So you get away without actually running a Linux kernel and can boot directly into the board, which is actually super cool because you have virtually no boot time. When I tried this, it was up in one second and that was more or less a delay getting an IP address from the DHCP server. So that could be an interesting target for people that need an FPGA going. The one I'll be showing today is the Raspberry Pi Pico. That's a fairly easy to use board because they came up with a clever idea of how to make it programmable by a normal person <laughs> that uh, has never touched a microcontroller. And I think that's a really cool approach to get people into the world. And then after they have discovered that, they can go to the more complicated ones. And the Espressif uh, series, they are kind of interesting because they have uh, both offered. They have ARM cores and RISC-V. And RISC-V should be the future, I guess. <laughs> Especially now that ARM is actually trying to uh, step up the licensing fees and stuff. 
And the ETH Zurich has a really big group that does super cool core implementations with floating point and all the other extra features. So if you're at the university there, I suggest you look into RISC-V a bit. And cool news from, I think, last week in uh, yeah, Infineon. They released an automotive embedded chip with official Rust support by the company. So it's, yeah, the ball is rolling. It's not uh, easy to stop it now, I guess. Yeah, so what are the differences? You have written a Hello World program and uh, you have seen those files, but some of them look a bit weird, right? So if we see here, does main RS? Well, this we have seen. We are in our comfort zone, everything's fine, right? Then the same is true for our cargo tomo. The cargo lock we don't touch, but it's generated for us. We have seen it, everything's fine. But what's up with uh, build RS? Fewer people will have run into this. This is used at the build uh, time for by cargo, mostly to emit uh, linker information, for example, or also to prepare code, right? If you have written a gRPC server or client, then you have used a build RS to build uh, from the gRPC sources um, your Rust abstraction and then compile your code. But uh, in the case of our embedded programming, this will be used to inform the linker of how to build the binary for the microcontroller. Then another file you probably have never seen or haven't used very often is this uh, .cargo config or config toml file. Um, this is more uh, a luxury, I guess, but it holds uh, easy to use run commands afterwards. So while you're developing, you do not have to remember, oh, how do I flush the thing? How do I start in everything? You can uh, prepare your commands that you want to use in there and then it will be automatically run for you. And it also holds some information for uh, building the binary in the end, like linker flags. And uh, this file is provided to you, <laughs> unless you really, really know how your microcontroller works, you don't really know that, need to write this yourself. This holds information of the memory locations on the microcontroller, so where the actual binary code has to go, where the RAM starts and uh, where the flash ends and stuff like that. Um, none of these files you actually have to code yourself. So for every controller that I've showed you before, there are template files on GitHub or files, um, template repositories with those prepared with the standard hello world of the embedded wo uh, world, which is blinking an LED. So don't be scared of all those extra files. You don't have to write them yourself. They are there for you and you just have to modify the main RS. And the last one is this embed uh, toml. This is now the uber luxury. <laughs> you can uh, install the cargo embed uh, tool and then you have a new cargo command that is called embed that will uh, flash the MCU for you and automatically start a debugging session and give you output and it's super fancy. I like it. But yeah, optional. And in this toml file you configure what is your actual controller, how do you want to run the debugging session or which protocol and all these other details. All right, oops. So the hello world of the embedded systems, blink an LED. Um, how does that uh, work in the Rust world? Well, in Rust, we have a powerful type system. So we use the type state pattern to abstract the machine states of the microcontroller in the programming language, meaning we can avoid problems that uh, can happen if you write normal C code, for example, that would classically have a define and then a number that is supposed to be the pin. Then you pass this around and then you hope, cross your fingers, that this is now I squared C set up and you can actually talk to your uh, temperature sensor. In uh, Rust, this crossing of fingers is not necessary because once you have configured your pin to be I squared C, it will have the type of uh, being I squared C um, trait compatible and therefore whatever driver you have written just accepts this type and you cannot run into the problem of a misconfigured pin for example or some uh, typo error, right? It's really easy to write a five instead of a six or something. And then your code doesn't work and you don't know why. That is an amazing advantage. Then I will show you well how to flush the firmware in multiple ways. 
yeah, how you can do um, logging and uh, well, printf debugging basically. <laughs> And uh, yeah, then how to do a remote debugging session in LLDB because um, GDB doesn't work on my computer, I found out. Shows you how a specialist of debugger I am. Um, and the amazing CMSYS DLP has the roll of the tongue uh, common microcontroller software interface standard debug access port. But that's what's implemented as a firmware that you can freely flash onto a Raspi. And that's the cool part, you can use two Raspberry Pis Pico, to flash them and debug them, so you don't have to buy an expensive uh, debug probe that runs in a few hundred bucks normally. You just get two of them, which you would have probably anyways, because you have one actual project that you're running with, and the second one will be your um, development board. All right, so let's hop into the code. So this is the amazing memory X file. I just wanted to show you to you that it's not really pertinent information for a normal person. Well, so, then here we have our cargo tomo, the config uh, file for the cargo building, and uh, we can see in uh, this line it is configured uh, for a runner, so on cargo run, to actually run this uh, probe run thing for our RP2040 chips, which is the chip on the Pico. And uh, further down, you can see the rust flags necessary to pull this off. And um, this is, as I said, provided to you in order to flash, <coughs> in order to flash the Pico with the manual method, I will have to change the comments. which I will do now. So now the runner will actually run this ELF to U, UF2 RS, which is a tool that converts the normal executable format into the format that the Raspi can read. And uh, to flash the Raspi, that's quite an effort. So let's power on the camera and make it visible. Yeah. Swoop. Okay, you can see this uh, button that says the boot select right there. And that's the cool part. If I hold this button, I will have to take off the microphone now, um, and connect it to the USB, it will be a mass storage device for the computer. So it will show up like a USB thumb drive. And then I can copy these um, ULF files onto it. So let's hold the button, pick the good cable. No, it's all good. Cool. So now we have um, the Raspi connected. I will show you quickly that I will probably need a hand. <laughs> so uh, thank you. <clears throat> so if we now look into our, why is the Oh, that's true. Sorry. And we can do picture in picture. There you go. Um, if we now look in our volumes, we will see that there is this Raspberry Pico mounted, right? And what the, the ELF tool does for us, it automatically pushes the image onto the Pico when it finds it and where it finds it. So all I have to do now in this uh, Pico example is to cargo run and it will build it, flash it, and now you can see that the Pico is blinking. That's a pain in the ass. All right, it's blinking. Woo! But uh, as you have seen, I've struggled pushing this button, putting the USB inside. Now, if you were to write a new iteration of your blinking code, then you have to do this on uh, a loop that's annoying. And probably also at some point you will break your USB connections, I guess. So the other option is I have two Raspberry Picos. Oh, wait, I'll have to go back to the camera. So I have two uh, Raspberry Picos connected to each other in a funny cable configuration. 
And uh, this uh, one here at the end is connected to uh, three pins that are not by default uh, soldered on. <laughs> you will have to do this yourself. But these are the ones that are actually doing the single wire debugging for the Pico port. And then there are two more connected here. My finger is visible or not? <laughs> yes. This is the serial port connection. So with the single wire debugging, you can put the processor into a mode where it accepts a new firmware coming in through the serial uh, communications. And then uh, the other one is connected. But all of these informations are available when you go to the probe run uh, software. They will show you how to connect all of this up. So let's see, does this blink? All right, so we are still blinking. This is why I will now change back the configuration. Should we switch? Yes. Oh no. So, because we want to use the probe run, but uh, that's in the future. Let's look at uh, the other cool files that we have. Thank you. I think I should be fine from now on. Um, we looked at memory X at uh, the main RS. We haven't really looked. Let's look at embed TOML next. Just a quick overview. At the very top it says, no, it was SWD is single wire debug. So that's the thing it uses to talk to the other Raspi to get it into program, uh, programming and debugging mode. And then you have all kinds of other cool uh, flags that you can uh, look up. The default config is provided to you by the template and it works amazing, I haven't really touched it. However, if you have some custom things that you want to do, it's uh, in there. And then of course the actual code. So how do we make the Raspi blink? The first line that is not a comment is uh, no STD. That's not uh, sexual transmitted diseases, that's uh, no standard library is available. So once you use that um, definition in uh, one of the attributes of a uh, Rust code, you will not get any of the luxury like a memory management, networking stack, file system, nothing. Um, right below it also says we don't have a main execute uh, function because the entry point is defined by the linker and um, that's different per MCU, so sometimes you will not have to use this one. But again, the template will have all of this set up for you. The next code lines are kind of important because they import all the stuff that you need to do um, comfortable debugging with the machine. The first one is just the entry point, but then this DE format, that means deferred formatting, it's a very clever solution where um, your logging statement is a string normally, right? That has uh, some formatting. You want to put um, uh, some uh, variable. Uh, you want to print some variable. But doing the actual string formatting on the MCU is taking quite a lot of processing power. So what this one does is it uses the string, sends off the string with the formatting information and serialized the data that is supposed to be formatted and your host computer actually does the string formatting in the end. So you don't uh, use a lot of CPU power to do that. It's literally just pushing uh, bits off to the other machine. And uh, the dformat RTT is uh, the protocol that is used to send off the binary information is uh, the Segar RTT. Uh, I forgot what it means. Real time something something. Um, yeah, so the next line. I can actually. Yes. The, the, the last phrase. What is the locker? You have the info. The Which one? Which line? Which line is the info? Twenty-six. Yeah. But you are using the last phrase. So where is the locker or where does it end up? Ah, yeah. So uh, as I said, no, this uh, D format basically uh, imports the the logging. So this holds the info stuff and so like as if you were using logger that you know from your ones, that's correct. So if I had a variable written here with the, the curly braces, it would do the formatting on the host, but in this case it just pushes the string towards my machine. And that's uh, what this does, yeah, correctly. Um, 
Yeah, we are using an output pin, so the actual LED to make it blink is a binary pin, so we want to put it high or low or toggle it to make it blink. So we need that uh, trait imported and that's where this HAL comes in, the hardware abstraction layer. And uh, this one is by the current Rust community of embedded programming providing uh, traits to abstract the hardware that is common between all the microcontrollers, right? Most of them will have this input output pin. Most of them have I2C support, SPI, um, serial uh, communications in one way or another. And uh, there are those abstractions that then will be implemented for each uh, board. And underneath that is the PAC, the peripheral access crate. And there you have lots of unsafe Rust code because there you have to write directly onto different registers to enable pins and do all kinds of shenanigans. And that's why we have those multiple layers to keep the safe layer towards the programmer. And only if you have to uh, implement a completely new driver or a completely new board, then you go on the PAC level. And oftentimes these PACs are not uh, programmed by hand. They are just converted from the information that the MCU provider gives you and it's auto-generated more or less from the SVD files. So if there are embedded programmers, they know. Uh, yeah, and that's also why um, we are importing from this hardware extraction layer. And the BSP is our Raspberry Pi Pico. And you can see here an alternative. So there are some other boards that are based on the RP2040 that provide some other peripherals or maybe less or maybe more, depends on the implementer. And for these, you would have other ones. So uh, a BSP is, as a common says, no, a board support package. But since it is Rust, it's supposed to be a board support crate, right? <laughs> but historically, it's uh, called a BSP. And with these, you can then uh, find different implementations of your board that might uh, diverge from the standard uh, Pico board. So, uh, but there's a public export of our BSP of the of abstraction layer and this blinky thingy is only using the HAL. Oftentimes the BSP also provides even further abstractions to have an easier access to more complicated hardware. Right, let's scroll uh, down in our code. So the main is much longer if anybody has ever done some Arduino IDE thing. The actual blinking is not even visible right now. <laughs> but we have to set up our hardware, right? So here we get our peripherals and all the other stuff that is basically standard that uh, you will have to set up to then get your clocks. And uh, with the clocks, you can then set up your delay handler. Um, I could explain all of this, but it will take too much time. <laughs> but uh, this is basically also happening if you are using the Arduino IDE, with, but there is some code in C++ hidden somewhere in the back that is done for you. In Rust, you, as of now, have to write this yourself or use the template. But there is effort going on to make this even easier for the lay person. Finally, we'll um, get access to our pins of the board. and. Uh, here you can see the nice abstraction. They actually call it LED, so it's pin number 25, but I don't have to remember that. I just uh, use the auto-completion and go, well, LED it is. And here we have the actual loop with the action, and uh, we are logging on and off. We're waiting for 500 milliseconds, and we set it high, and we set it low. So that's an actually code that is fairly readable. If you want to code your own stuff, this loop is what you are going to replace. However, this quickly gets out of hand, right? So right now we are blinking an LED, and maybe if you are, all you are doing is repeatedly checking a temperature sensor, then the loop is also fine. But as soon as you want to at the same time communicate with your host, uh, read multiple sensors, um, maybe process the data, before you send it off, right? If you want to use LoRaWAN to send it off, you will not be able to send kilobytes of data. You have to be able to compact this a bit. Then um, it would be better to use some abstraction that helps you writing um, concurrent code on a microcontroller. Because yes, you can hand roll it, but not so easy. And Arctic, which I will show you later, is one of the solutions. Good, now let's see what happens. If we use a Cargo Run now, that I have configured it to run this uh, program tool, 
you see that I will have to connect the second RASP. And uh, can you see the LED blinking? No. Now you can. In the corner down, the LED is blinking. And I will now try to Uh, no, that's not how a demo works, because we will have to make it blink weirdly, right? So let's make this 100 milliseconds only, so it will be on very short, that's dumb. Well, it will be off very shortly. Um, we cargo run it, and it flashes, and it shows us the messages from the logger, on, off, on, off, on, off, with now this weird uh, pattern. And this way you don't have to plug and do some weird stuff, you can just run your code, you see what's happening with your logging messages, and you have the full control as if you were a losing logger, right? You can do uh, different error levels and uh, format your uh, data types. You have to use a different formatting trait though, but this I will show later, hopefully. Um, debugging. I am not a good debugger, <laughs> but if I now run uh, cargo embed, then you get the same thing, but you s you've seen it, it's clear to the screen and it is running our uh, Blinky. And it starts the debugger in the back end, right? I will have to set up my uh, Selich a bit differently because otherwise you will see nothing. So... Good. Okay. Okay, we run a cargo embed, we run uh, the debugger, and I'm in the wrong directory, sorry. The classic. And now it remembers the command, yeah, it remembers the command. All right, so luckily LLDB is uh, GDB remote compatible. So I can connect, and you can see the blinking has stopped, right? because the code has stopped, there's no more info thingy happening on the right. And uh, yeah, you can see if I use a thread continue, it continues to blink and you continues to do the output. And uh, process interrupt, we can stop it again and then you can inspect uh, the registers on the machine and even jump into your code and stuff like that. This is a bit more comfortable and visual code. I personally don't debug too much because I, from experience, haven't had, uh, I don't know, too much experience where it actually helped me debug stuff. It's mostly my brain. Um, so I will uh, quit this, but you see in principle it works and it is provided fairly easily to you when you use the cargo embed tool. Yes, I want to. Cool, what else did I want to show? Not that. Right, printf debugging a little b. Good uh, question so far. Right, so if we want to talk to the Raspi, we have to come up with a protocol, right? And uh, sure, we can go big because this Pico is actually a very powerful CPU and use a JSON or gRPC or some other fancy thing. But uh, this is the embedded world. We should be as small and concise as possible. And there, um, there I also have prepared some code. So, no, proto, blink, proto. Okay, um, at the very top you can now see how you can mix no standard with a standard code because if you want to use it on the host, well it needs a standard library to function 
And if we want to run it on the Pico, because we want to create a, a message on the Pico as well to send it back, we have to use no STD where you have no standard library, right? And at the very top, you can see that if I'm not using the feature as standard, then, well, I am not using the standard library. <laughs> um, and then the deformatting, the, the deferred format, is only necessary if I have no target OS. Again, using it on the embedded controller. It's not necessary to run this on the host code. And uh, from there, we have then some other cool uh, crates that work on both systems. So heapless provides us uh, an interface to a vector, but that's not uh, a vector in the common sense. You have to pre-initialize uh, some ma maximum buffer size that this vector can hold. And therefore, you don't need a memory allocator and it's an easy hack to quickly get more complicated algos that need uh, some vector operations going. And then postcard is the actual uh, protocol if you want. So that's a very compact form of serializing the structs or other data types that you want to send across the wire. It uses SERDI, which is, or SERDI, I don't know how to pronounce that one. Um, which is just uh, you know, providing the traits to then use postcard to serialize our data. So since we are at Rust uh, Zurich, the header I chose to keep our packets separated is RCRH. And uh, the maximum uh, message buffer size is 260, way overkill, because we are not sending much complicated stuff across the wire. And uh, here's the cool part. We get to write everything in Rust. So there's no gRPC definitions that need to be pre-changed into Rust code that then is injected into your thingy and then breaks or whatever. We write Rust code how we like it, which is an enum. We have three different messages. We have a ping, a pong, and uh, to change the, how the LED is behaving. So blinking on and off and how long the po pause between the blinks is supposed to be. And um, yeah, the ping. And Pong makes a lot of sense to just on principle test if uh, what you're building is working or is the controller there. So these messages I kind of always include. And the ID I found also kind of practical because you then can figure out are, are they coming in in order and also verify that your Pong answer is actually to the ping that you've sent and not some random side effect of your microcontroller. Okay, down here you can see that this is now only built if we have a standard library available. And this is then implementing the display trait for our message. It's a bit redundant because, you know, the ping message becomes rendered out as if it was uh, actually rendered by the debug. But it's just for uh, demonstration purposes. Then I provide uh, two internal methods, uh, functions to encode and decode the messages. And here we now have our parser. It's a really dumb one, so don't use that in production, I guess. But it looks for the header once it found it. It just uh, tries to then figure out, oh, how long is the message? And then puts this into postcard, tries to deserialize. And if it is not happy, it returns all kinds of uh, error states. And again, once we are in standard library, we get to use uh, this one to write a message on to something that implements the write trait. And here we have something that wraps the message into the binary format that is supposed to be. <clears throat> Down here in the tests, you might get a feel for how this works. Here you can see the vector setup. So you have to provide the maximum size that this vector can hold, right? This is the heapless vector and not the standard one. So it's of, si of the type is, as you know, right? We have a U8 for the bytes and then uh, 16 of those can be held. So if you keep pushing to your vector more than 16 bytes, this will fail, of course, because we cannot allocate uh, more memory. So these uh, 16 bytes are held on uh, the stack, basically, in the MCU if you want. Right, so here we are just uh, pushing a message that doesn't make sense. And the parse result will be, of course, the header is invalid, I haven't found the message. And uh, the, the other tests are basically doing all of the same. And down here, you can actually see if we create this ping message, it's super compact because those first four bytes are actually our weird header. So this is the tiny small r and then crh. And uh, the ping message is uh, this two, a zero, and the five is from this ID. So that's super compact. Uh, postcard, I can uh, 
strongly suggest using. And the really cool part is you can actually use this through the whole stack. So you have your embedded controller. This talks to a host machine that then talks to a web front end. If you write this web front end in uh, Wasm, then you can push this postcard message all the way to the browser and uh, you never have to convert into JSON or do some other magic. It, uh, it stays in Rust, it's uh, stable and super fast. There's no overhead in uh, data there. And uh, my header idea is probably not clever either, so you can get rid of this too. <coughs> cool. So now we ran through this, but now we actually need some host software that talks to the controller, right? Good, so I have, we have a small command line tool. Here on line 20, we can see that uh, Blink CLI has to be called with the actual TTY that we want to talk to. And then I made a stupid CLI interface. You just put true or false for it should blink or should not, and then how many milliseconds pause. And um, uh, so here I'm using this write message that we've implemented before. So if we have something that implements standard write, so in this case, the TTY, I can send off the message super comfortably. It's just one line of code. And that's how that works. And the other way around, if it comes uh, in, which is this loop here. So if we read on the port, then we can parse it out and we react to the different error states and uh, show what's up. Good. This is the host side. Now we get to the fun part with the Arctic. So Arctic version two. Uh, Arctic used to be called RTFM, but they changed their name, but a long time ago, I think already, like a year ago, or whatever. And they recently kind of stabilized version two in the sense that the API is stable. And since I wanted to hold this talk, I was thinking, okay, I will show version two already because it allows to use async tasks, which is really cool. And uh, yeah, this talk will be old faster than I want if I would have shown you number one, right? Um, with this async task, you can then write uh, code as if you were writing like uh, Tokyo style stuff, because they provide APIs that mimic this uh, very much, right? You have channels and uh, other cool async features that Tokyo provides within uh, the Arctic uh, ecosystem. And it is actually helping you to do uh, real-time interrupt control. And uh, it's easy to handle interrupts. The interrupt handling themselves, though, are not asynchronous. They are still uh, normal functions that get triggered by the interrupts of the microcontroller. And the way we will talk to the actual uh, controller is, or the microcontroller is over USB CDC, so communication device class, um, which is implementing a serial uh, terminal and uh, yeah, in order to keep the USB polling going, we are using interrupts. And that's also one of the limitations, if we remember the loop before for the blinking. Uh, USB poll has to be reacted to within uh, 10 milliseconds, I believe. If that's not happening, the operating system will just kick your device because you're not respecting the standard, right? Now, if you want to blink something every 500 milliseconds, but you have to react to a message every 10 milliseconds, your loop already becomes a bit complicated, right? <laughs> Um, but uh, there are interrupts happening on the microcontroller, luckily, when a polling request is coming in over USB. And uh, that's where Arctic is helping us doing this in parallel, reacting to the polling requests and running our actual blinking code. And on top of this, you know, parsing the message and reacting to the stuff. All right. Code again. So crossing my fingers, this works because, of course, yesterday it broke. Um, right. So here we are back. They are also nice to us. They also provide a Raspberry Pi Pico template for us, the Arctic guys. Um, 
first lines we have already seen, right? Uh, we don't have a stable standard library, there's no main, but we have to use nightly. And we need this feature, because otherwise um, the whole async thingy wouldn't uh, work. Then I used uh, the Atomic for uh, counting messages, I believe. Yes, exactly. So that's down here. Then the deferred uh, formatting. The panic probe is necessary when the machine panics that it uh, stops working. Here we have uh, the deferred formatting stim time stamp. So the atomic counter is used to count how many messages the deferred formatting was already sending off. And uh, this is then kind of like a prefix. So if you know from log formatting, you often have like a timestamp or some other prefix information, which machine this is running on or whatever. This is more or less uh, that, but for the deferred formatting. And here we have the macros that set up the Arctic. The way that uh, they structure it is they have a module. So in this case, I called it app, but you can call it however you want. And uh, this app now is talking to a device. So in this case, this is our Raspi Pico, and uh, we have to hand them directly the peripheral access crate because it is handling the interrupts for us and stuff. It needs really low-level hardware access. We want to use the peripherals it provides, and uh, our dispatcher is using the interrupts. Um, if you have some power-saving uh, requests and whatever, they have a really active and very helpful uh, chat on Matrix they will probably be able to help you how to do this with Arctic if you have more specialized um, uh, hand, handling requests for your, for your application. Okay, so inside this module, we are importing all the stuff that we uh, need. Uh, which one is actually pertinent? Not too many. Yeah, this one is important. So in order to handle a delay or a timeout, the Arctic guys implemented it differently than before. So before we got the delay handler that is using the sysstick of the Raspberry Pi Pico. And um, that's actually kind of a waste, right? If I'm waiting for 500 milliseconds, it will wait 499 systicks and on the 500th it will, uh, you know, let you do something. Um, this one is actually activating an interrupt that uh, tells the board, well, you know, wake me up again in 500 milliseconds. Way more efficient. And then here we have the import to set up a USB device. So luckily Rust uh, provides that to us. And then on top of that, there is a crate that provides us a serial uh, device on top. You can also implement, I don't know, a keyboard, a mouse, a joystick. All of this is kind of already written from somebody. Uh, but of course, come up with your own ideas and then write your own crate. USB is uh, fairly flexible. Oop. So, then that's an important concept. Here we set up our LED pin. Now we have to know the number 25. It's no longer nicely available for us because we had to import it at the top from the, the pack. And then we mark this struct uh, shared. And shared means that these are resources that multiple tasks within the Arctic uh, system can be uh, can access uh, these informations. And we need that, right? Because we have the USB handler that will uh, get the information if we should blink the LED and how long uh, we want to do it. And here we have a double-ended queue provided also by the heapless uh, crate that then holds those messages to be reacted on. So these informations we have to share, but uh, local information is also available, so our task that will actually blink the LED will be the only one that has access to this hardware, which will often be a restriction, right? If you have uh, an SPI connection open, you don't want to share that with other tasks because then you would hand, have to hand off um, the access to it, and then you can easily uh, come up with a synchronization problem. And then also locally, we only use the USB device once, and uh, we only also have one task, or in this case, the interrupt handler that talks to the serial port. And then, of course, we need uh, a message buffer for our uh, Blink protocol. And uh, we have defined the, me the maximum message buffer size. So if we ever change that, it changes all over the code, and we don't have to manually um, re rewrite the code. So initialization, 
is a long block. Is there anything that is super important to show? Not really. All right. So this is how comfortable you can set up a USB device. You just uh, get your USB allocator going with all the registers. Here you set up the serial port that hand gets handed over the USB bus. And then once we have this USB uh, device, we can now come up with a manufacturer name, serial port, whatever, and a serial number, and which uh, class the device has, and we are ready. Then we set our variable that we want to use to true, because we want to blink. And this is the command that will spawn the task that actually blinks the LED. The task uh, will come up soon. Yep. We initialize our uh, double-ended queues for the messages and the first uh, debug message. So once all of this happened and nothing broke, we will actually see send me a message on our debugger output. Right. Mm. So again here we have the shared information between the tasks, blinking LED and uh, the local stuff. This needs to be uh, returned from the init function and um, Arctic generates code for you that then passes this around and then makes the magic happen for these um, macros. Because here you have the, to define which local stuff you want to have access to. So in this task we want to talk to this uh, local LED thing. If I wanted to use this again in another task, the compile will not work because you can use local stuff only for one task. And the shared thing is, I want to use the blink and the pause information. And here we have our loop again with our pause, but now we want to be able to dynamically react to a pause. We set up a default of 500 milliseconds, so if we haven't received any message yet, we are still blinking. And here you can see how we can actually access those um, shared informations. They have to be uh, locked. It is a mutex, if I'm not mistaken, what uh, they will use uh, in the background for you by Arctic. And uh, so you get your uh, context from here, right? That is auto-populated with uh, this uh, macro from up here. And you have access then to your blinking and the pause information. Once you have the lock, this gets passed into this closure with the two arguments. And here I can check if LED blink is true. Then I will use the toggle method, which is pretty cool. I don't have to go high-low, I just say toggle and it will just jump to the other state. And here I can uh, set the new pause information that came in through the message. Whoa. Yes. Yes. Ah, yes. Uh, on the Raspberry Pico, they do not directly support multi-core support. You can run two Arctics at the same time, though. So on each core, one. <laughs> and then you have to communicate between them. That's uh, kind of uh, possible. Um, I think that they actually abstract into a mutex where the system can do, as you just said, multiple things in actual parallelity. But uh, here they do it also because it's easier for how they implement you know, the async uh, executor to make sure that this uh, resource is locked for you since it is shared with multiple tasks. So if it is, in this case, shared with an interrupt, your actual code execution is halted, halted by uh, the MCU. And then this new function jumps in. And if it wants to modify the thing but the lock is, open, uh, is uh, held, then it should uh, not work. Yes? I think what it does is open critical sections, so it basically makes it possible for other interrupts to... Uh, yeah, exactly, that's also true. It depends on the, the MCU, so that's very correct. It's so yeah, thank you. So yeah, I repeat what he said, very true. So they run a critical section, which is a feature that the MCU provides, and while this critical section is running, the other uh, interrupts do not have the right to actually jump in. So make sure that your locks are held very shortly. Too long, okay. Yes, I'll... We'll do some questions, but... Yeah. 
Okay, uh, yeah, um, do I have to show this? Not uh, really. Just quickly how this uh, interrupt is, bind, uh, is binding works. So here we bind to this USB control interrupt. So on USB, we are actually handling this important uh, polling. And uh, if there's nothing that is coming from the host, then we immediately return interrupt done. If there's actually some uh, information, we continue and read from the serial port. Let's uh, quickly run this thing and then I'm done. <laughs> because the actual implementation of how to parse it you have seen on the host side, more or less. Cool. Uh, I will have to switch over here. Stop the thing. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, true, we have to use uh, nightly. Oh, nine. Uh, for those who cannot see, he pl uh, asked plus nightly on the command line, which is a very handy override from Rust up that enables nightly just for this command. So, car go run. Uh, sure, why not? So you can see here that uh, the serial number in the serial number is used as part of the TTY. That's very practical. And uh, now it is just using pings and sends the default message to to the blinking, which is not visible. It's not blinking at all. No, no, it broke. <laughs> so. True, and then whatever, 400. Two S. No. The classic. <coughs> they, uh, they have uh, broken the thing. I can try to run this differently, but. Uh, Reset always works, right? <coughs> yep. So it's still uh, blinking, right? Mm -hmm. Woo! Okay, and now we run our host thingy and we say false because we want to stop it. And it stopped. Woohoo! We still get the. <laughs> And then, uh, in theory, if I go uh, through and put uh, 800 or whatever, then it should uh, turn on again. Whee. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I must have confused it with all the debugging sessions that I just cancelled with Control C or whatever. I hope that that explains the problem. All right, questions. And go. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, very cool presentation. And uh, yeah, thanks for the demo. Uh, one observation, so from this code, I didn't see any unsafe uh, code. Is that correct that the Arctic is abstracting yeah. all the unsafe stuff and sharing so you don't have to? That's the whole point of how the current uh, infos uh, ecosystem on Rust works anyways, right? You have this PAC that the packs, they have a lot of unsafe code because they directly talk to the hardware and do stuff but you barely really use them unless you implement something like Arctic, right? Then you have the HAL, the hardware abstraction layer, that is already safe code. There's no more unsafe from this moment onwards. And then uh, crates like Arctic or Embassy, there are many uh, solutions out there that will help you write concurrent code. Um, they will uh, only give you safe code to work with. You can, you know, still, if you have some performance uh, problem that you need to fix, use your own unsafe codes, of course. <laughs> But the actual abstraction of the hardware is uh, safe, yes. Cool. More questions? Is, uh, if I 
remember correctly, microcontrollers come in all different shapes and sizes and, and kinds and some very exotic stuff out there. Is there any limitations as to what Rust can handle maybe in terms of its memory model uh, supporting some architectures which is just impossible due to safety guarantees of Rust? Well, the actual talking to the microcontroller is done with unsafe code. So from this point of view, no. <laughs> but in practice, there are limitations because Rust, as of today, is only available realistically with LLVM as the backend. And LLVM does not have the biggest support for lots of microcontrollers, right? So like the, the um, Arduino Uno, this chip is a tier, tier 3 and has actual problems, but not because Rust doesn't know what to do with LLVM is actually uh, having bugs. Um, so ARM, you're kind of safe. RISC-V is very well supported. Then uh, there are some other ones, like the new Infineon thingy that has official Rust support, right? Uh, yeah, you will have to find out yourself from this limitation, but since GCC is working on a Rust front end for their compiler, and they have a lot of good support for all kinds of embedded, then uh, this problem will solve itself if you want. So maybe don't invest too much time trying to fix LLVM and wait for GCC, I guess. If you have an exotic uh, board, I'm, I'm saying. <laughs> um, or otherwise, I don't know, uh, su suggest to the board developer to help LLVM implement a proper um, compiler. Right. Well, thank you, Mike.